My seminary professor, Will Spong, used to tell us that there are only three things that really change the world. Not money, not political muscle. The three things that change the world appeal directly to the imagination and change what we see and what we want and what we do. And they are art and stories that shifts our perspective and puts us in someone else's head or shoes. Witness or examples that show us something we didn't think could be done and kindle our hope and wash away our excuses. And friendship where people see strength in us that we didn't see in ourselves. And by that standard, I think we've had a pretty transformational day because we have heard stories about overcoming limiting labels in school and overcoming our own prejudices towards people in need. We have seen examples of remarkable things that kids can do in the Bronx or young people can do in Detroit. And we have had a group of new friends who are ready to hold us accountable for this optimism. People who have reminded us of how much joy there is in space and food and all of the simple things that maybe we haven't thought about for a while. And the question for us is, what are we going to do with all of this inspiration? What are we going to do with all of this transformative energy? And I wonder how many of you, at some point during the day today, have thought about quitting your job? <laughs> and how many of you have thought about giving money away and volunteering and how many of you have thought about picking your guitar up again? <laughs> or going to the Space Museum? I wish you could eavesdrop on the conversations that a business school teacher has with people about this question of what are you going to do with your life? Because when students start talking to you about it, they will tell you that all they want is a job that impresses their friends, placates their parents, makes enough money, won't make them too miserable, and doesn't require that they sell out their soul, usually in that order. <laughs> and if you talk to them a little longer, what they'll tell you is that what they really want is work that they can bring all their gifts to and work where they can lose themselves and invest everything and be wholehearted and work that makes a difference in the world. And the problem here is much tougher than this one because no one is going to give you that job. You are going to have to design it for yourself and you are going to have to bring it into being. I was a 28-year-old assistant professor in economics, and I wasn't doing any research, which, if you're on the tenure track, is pretty much an oncoming train. And what I was doing was going to the theater and reading plays and reading theology and talking about the big questions with my friends that were spiritually minded, and I felt like I needed help. So I asked my friends, who is the wisest man in town? And they sent me to William Spong, the seminary professor, who had a reputation for tough love and clear-eyed truth. And I said, look, I love theology, I love theater, and I love business education, so you tell me which one to do and I'll do it. And he said, that is the stupidest question anyone has asked me. <laughs> because you just told me you love three things. And you're asking me which of your limbs you should cut off so you can limp along on the remaining one. You have to do all three. I said, yeah, but what am I going to do for a living? He said, we'll see. I said, but what about my career? He said, you don't need a career. You need a calling. I said, this sounds weird. He says, yes, but if you don't do it, I can't help you. <laughs> so my requirement, if you want to work with me, is you promise to spend two hours every week, at least, wholeheartedly engaged in each one of these things. And if not, you're on your own. And I was furious because this directive so subverted my expectations. I had come in for someone to give me a path that I could go down with all my might. I wanted a shot of cortisone, and he gave me this weird homeopathic thing. summed up in his motto, don't discard. 
which is so counter to everything that I'd ever heard. If you're going to be credible, if you're going to take your gifts seriously, you've got to pick something and do it. You've got to bear down and hold your nose and work and do it. Don't discard that, that keeping each one of these things that you have the gift to love in the mix creates a conversation among them that becomes your reliable source of inspiration. So I went down to the coffee house on 6th Street, and every week I had a little monologue that I'd prepared, and I performed it. And I went to the seminary, and I enrolled in a theological ethics class, and I gave my heart to it. And I showed up every day for my students, and I taught business as best I could. And when I resigned my assistant professorship, I got hired by the business school to create the curriculum for economics. I got more teaching, more money, and less research. Something was clearly already happening. The people who advise young people on careers have a new science about this that says, the more gifts you have, the bigger the challenge is. In a society that celebrates giftedness, we often overlook the puzzle that this creates for young people. It's almost like all of your gifts are living inside of you and you suddenly have responsibility for fully employing a small economy. And there aren't a lot of off-the-rack jobs that bring together your particular mix of unique gifts. You're going to have to figure that out. And we don't get told that very early. And yet every effort we make to tamp those down and try to over-specialize and concentrate on what comes easily is kind of like the musician who got crowded out on the xylophone. He's going to find a way to get back in <laughs> somehow. Or else he's going to go off and grab another instrument and start making trouble. All of these gifts that have to be employed, a design problem, wholehearted engagement. I went back to see Will Spong. He said, how's it going? What's coming together? I said, I don't know. What do you mean? He goes, how are things beginning to inform your next step? I said, I don't know. He said, you're not listening. What's your practice for integrating what's happening in your life? I said, you mean like meditation? He said, I don't think meditation is going to work for you. Why don't you get up in the morning and write three pages, whatever comes to you, just fill the paper and see what your life is saying. And then you come back and talk to me and we'll watch what's taking shape. This brilliant practice that comes from Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way, is one way of listening to what's trying to emerge in your life. And if you've got all of these pieces at work, even in homeopathic dose, a conversation will start to happen and you'll start to trust a process that's becoming your work. And so what I noticed was that as I began to write and listen, I was starting to use instructional technology in my theater pieces. You put an overhead projector on stage, you pretend you're an economist, and immediately the audience is in a state of primal fear. <laughs> I used PowerPoint before that was cool. All the stuff we were doing in our classes became integrated into theater. And likewise, I was using techniques from improvisation and things we were doing in our plays in class to try to bring the economics lessons alive. Clearly, things were beginning to talk to each other. And then one day, Will said, why don't you teach a class on the spirituality of money at the seminary? I said, well, I've never done that before. He said, yes, but you can. And you need to show people what you love. Lead with what you love. And all of a sudden, you'll be crowdsourcing advice from the bigger world about what's trying to emerge through you. If you show people where you're trying to go, people who are further along on the path, who are wiser, who have better perspective, they will become your partners in what you are trying to make. And we did a class on the spirituality of money, which is a funny thing to teach at a seminary, because then you have to acknowledge that for most of us, money is God, which is probably a pretty interesting way to try to learn about what another God might be. The next thing that happened was very surprising. A man who was organizing a technological entrepreneurs conference in Austin called and he said, we want you to do a play for our 360 summit. And I said, oh, no, no, I don't do plays for business. That's not what I do. He goes, Stephen, we've seen your work and we need someone who can reflect to us on the spiritual significance of the technology stock market bubble. And I thought about that for a minute. <laughs> and I thought, I'm in. Yeah, I, I'll do that. And I performed this piece on stage with the entrepreneurs. And all of a sudden, 
many companies were asking me, will you come write a play for us? Come study what we're trying to do. See it from your angle and give our people something to react to so that they can have the conversation that's hard for them to have about what's happening in our business. Now, if you had told me when I was 18 that I could get a job as a corporate pastoral playwright, I would have majored in that. No questions asked. And I went back to Will and I said, so, when do I quit my job? When do I launch out into the world and do this? When do I jump to the next lily pad? And he said, don't quit your job. Bend it until it breaks. Find a way to make the job that you have more like the one you imagine. You must not trust your fantasies, he said. They are wild and untamed, and you're reacting against your parents. You are all this stuff that's going on. Your passions are a seething cauldron. <laughs> Bend your job until it breaks, and let that discipline guide what happens next. And so, sure enough, I took on the professional development program. I started teaching classes on the side for the students on interview skills. Everything that seemed fun, I found a way to pack it into my job. And when the offer came to go help start a new business school that was predicated on the belief that everyone has a calling, if they will just seek it, I was ready to go. And it was such an easy, smooth transition because it was simply acknowledging something that had already happened. The last bit of advice that I got from Will that seemed so powerful was how important it is to get freedom by facing fear. I work now with our students at Acton on finding their calling, and after they dig through to find this work that seems to bring together themselves in a wholehearted way, they always say, yeah, but I could never make enough money if I did that. Well, let's look at a spreadsheet. How much do you need? And the answer is often surprising. And with that fear out of the way, they reach for the next one. Yeah, but my spouse would never go for it. Well, have you talked to them? What do they say? And they go home and they have these conversations, not while the spouse is doing the dishes and making their life possible in graduate school, but a little later when there's room. And what they find out is that their mates are usually 100% behind what's trying to emerge in their lives. I think that we have a tremendous opportunity to help young people by reframing the way they think about finding the work that they're going to do not in terms of some competition or satisfying expectations or keeping up with the lowest common denominator chatter, but asking students instead empowering questions like, what are you learning? What do you love? What's trying to happen in your life? What fear have you overcome? Because those questions clear the way for people to take the transformational insights they get from conversations like this, from examples like this, and put it into practice to make something that is uniquely powerful and uniquely them. Thank you. <laughs>